Hey everyone, John Bartz and Brian Hodzik here with Network Consulting Services, your dive team leaders today as we go deep on patch management. We've got a lot to cover here in 60 minutes. Servers, workstations, physical, virtual, agentless, on-prem, third-party apps, and Microsoft apps. So please feel free to ask the questions down below in the Q&A section. Uh, Brian's going to be monitoring that throughout. Uh, goggle delivery going out to all the attendees uh, today, so we'll send that out next week. And we've got hats and visors to those who are asking great questions today. Uh, Brian's going to finish up with the cloud offer, a special offer from Ivanti at the end as well. So welcome, and let's go ahead and get started, Brian. Thanks, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Brian Hotzik. Um, I'm an engineer here with uh, NCSI. And um, today we're going to talk about um, patching um, our, our various systems with Avanti products. Um, you know, I wish that patching really got the recognition that it needed. Uh, sadly, we're, we're never going to get a medal for doing our patch jobs. And, um, you know, the, one of the big problems I see with patching is it just feels like no matter how good we do it, everything resets. You know, the clock resets every single month or every single time a, a new set of patches comes out. So um, it is kind of a thankless job. Um, hopefully I can show you some techniques and some tools that can bring um, a, a little bit more ease to the situation and make your patching lives um, a lot easier. So uh, today we're going to uh, be going through a couple of different products. I want to talk about uh, Vonti Security Controls product, uh, and I want to talk about the Endpoint Management product. Um, and between two, those two uh, uh, systems, you know, hopefully make your patch lives um, a lot easier. So let me jump into it and uh, show you a little bit more about uh, uh, those various products. First, I want to start with uh, Avanti Security Controls. Um, now, uh, this has a great lineage of uh, where this particular product came from. Uh, many people are familiar with the company called Shavlik. Uh, many years ago, uh, formerly Landesk purchased the Shadow Company, and we've incorporated uh, a lot of the technologies into our, our patching system here. So if you've heard of that company before, you've used it in the past, uh, this is that same lineage of where that, that product came from. Um, one of my favorite things, as you can see right can, kind of here on the main page as we log in, um, is this visual representation. Um, a lot of times patching is this very convoluted uh, problem, and we don't know exactly what's going on or what machines need what. Um, I love that I get a very easy visual look right here. You know, right now I have my uh, devices grouped by, you know, servers and workstations. Um, and I can very easily see, you know, red is bad, green is good. Red means I'm missing a patch. Uh, green means that I have a patch uh, outstanding uh, on, a, on a particular machine. I've implied that patch. So very, very easy to represent that in a visual fashion. Um, one of the biggest kind of claims to fame that we have in uh, Avanti Security Controls um, is uh, uh, this setting over here. Uh, see, there's a category up at the top called agent state. Um, notice that a good chunk of my devices here are set to no agent. Um, you know, we can actually scan for and patch uh, vulnerabilities without needing an agent on the machine. Um, and that, you know, may seem like a small thing, but, you know, it's a very, very big thing when you really think about, you know, not having to maintain uh, the underlying agent state. Um, a lot of times uh, customers tell me that uh, too many of their tools, they feel like they're airplanes. You know, for every hour that it's up in the air, they have to do, you know, a certain amount of maintenance to keep that up and going. And it's, it's a very, very heavy maintenance product. Um, you know, we want security controls to feel a lot more like a car. You get a lot more driving out of it before you have to go in and take it in for the occasional oil change. You, you're actually consuming the tool instead of just babysitting the tool and making sure that it's, that it's working. So... Um, and then additionally, what server administrator has ever said, you know what I want more of? I want more agents on my systems. You know, nobody's ever said that. So being able to uh, patch and uh, maintain these systems without an agent is, you know, is, is a, huge, uh, a huge benefit. Um, from a, a discovery perspective, if you see this little icon right here next to the machine name, um, if you recognize that, you can see that's actually a VMware logo. So uh, Shavik was actually owned by VMware for many years. And so uh, they integrated some great um, uh, API technology into, uh, into their product so that we can um, discover machines, we can uh, patch machines. We can even do things like, look at this, this is a template. We can patch uh, virtual machine templates and discover them. That's a big blind spot normally where you know, we forget that there's these machines that exist out there um, and our... Uh, uh, you know, not powered on regularly, so we're, we forget about them. So we can uh, power them on, patch them, shut them back down, keep them there from a, a, a template perspective. 
Um, so here I have all of my uh, devices. Um, you can see that I have uh, lots of different type of operating systems here. So um, I've got Windows server operating systems. I've got um, Linux uh, operating systems up here. I've got uh, Red Hat and CentOS. Um, and then I also have workstations. Um, Avanti Security Controls can patch both uh, servers and workstations. Um, you're going to see that it maybe has a little bit more of a bend towards servers, just you know, a couple of extra server style functions. Um, and the next product I want to talk about, Avanti Endpoint Manager, kind of has the opposite of that. It's a little bit more of an endpoint uh, bend and twist to it. So um, uh, this uh, lets you uh, uh, determine which exact one you want to use. A lot of my customers end up using both. They have the um, the, the endpoint manager for their workstations and the ISEC for their servers. As a matter of fact, a lot of people segregate that duty anyway. It's different teams, there's different maintenance schedules, there's kind of different functions. And so having those independent is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, okay, so I'm scrolling through here. I can uh, take a look down here at the bottom, um, look at the, uh, you know, the outstanding patches that I have, um, see what patches are installed, what patches are missing. Um, when I'm ready to go, I can actually, uh, you know, kick this off and, you know, for example, do a patch scan or maybe I want to deploy all the missing patches. I can do that for a, a single machine, a group of machines. You know, I'm doing it kind of ad hoc here, but um, you very well could be doing this based on a schedule where you're saying, you know, it's a, it's a maintenance window or something like that. Um, and up here at the top, we have our, our deployment templates. These are very important to how we apply the patches. You know, applying patches and rebooting, it's not fundamentally a diff difficult task, but all of the nuances around server management and doing it at the right time and who are we interacting with and things like that make it that we need to have very fine grained control over how this actually functions. So let's go create a new uh, deployment over here at the, uh, in our deployment templates and walk through some of the options that we have. So uh, let's call this demo template up there at the top. Um, now, here you see I have some cool things under our deployment actions, like shutting down SQL or, or IIS. You know, maybe we need to have those functions shut down before we apply patches or before, before we apply scans. Um, so I could, I could shut down those particular server functions. Um, I could pop up with something on the, on the machine saying that we were gonna be doing uh, patches. Um, I could do a pre-deployment reboot. On servers, that's pretty handy to actually, you know, clear it out, get all the services restarted. Maybe uh, there's a reason, you know, the machine's been up for a long time. We need to clear all that out before we apply any patches. Um, Post-deployment reboot, I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, after we've applied the patches, the patches um, uh, need to get, uh, go into effect on the machine, we need to reboot that. So various options for rebooting, how we reboot, uh, what, what it looks like when we interact with the user, this little box can pop up and interact with the user. Um, uh, you know, again, on servers, we're not oftentimes interacting with users, but still having some kind of input there. Um, email is really cool because in uh, many ecosystems, maybe there's a certain team or a certain person that's in charge of the patching, um, but then the, the people that are uh, responsible for the servers are someone else. So, for example, I could go in here and create a machine owner, and I could send out an email that is our deployment notification for the machine owner. So I'm in charge of patching, and Bob's in charge of the SQL servers, you know, I'm going to send out an email to Bob that says, by the way, here's uh, the patches that I applied. Here's what I did to your server. You know, thank you very much. So uh, I can notify the system administrators or machine owners or people who are responsible for these servers um, that I am actually, uh, you know, doing something to their machines. So um, I love that email being able to, uh, to, to talk to my uh, machine owners that way. Um, custom actions is great for the people that, uh, uh, you know, have those unique servers. Everyone's got unique servers, right? Oh man, mine is super special. This one server, you can't just reboot it. After I reboot it, I have to start up these services in a special order. Or before we, uh, you know, before we do something, we have to shut down a service or, you know, anything like that. No problem. I can come in here to my custom actions and I can say that I want to run something. Um, and uh, for example, down here at the bottom, I'm going to do it after I reboot. After I reboot, after applying patches, maybe I want to say, um, run the command called after reboot dot ps1. So I've written a PowerShell script to do whatever. I don't care, start services or run some function or, or whatever you think. And then after I reboot that machine, it's going to execute that and that server is going to come back in the right way. Or, um, you know, doing that as part of, uh, you know, before reboot. You know, I don't want to apply any patches yet. I need to do something more complex. Um, this is where we can start to have the conversation around what is the, you, you know, what is the complexity of our particular patching situations. Workstations, yeah, they're kind of boring. As long as we don't interrupt the user, let's just do them. But servers can be much more complex than that. We need to plan them. We need to have maintenance windows. Maybe we need to do something 
um, very complex around, uh, you know, it's a web server and we've got to talk to a load balancer and we've got to take it out of the pool and we've got to apply the patch to one and then we've got to admit it back into the load balancing pool and test it and things like that. So here's a very rudimentary way to do it with the um, uh, custom actions that we have inside of a deployment template. But we have a couple of other cool options at our disposal. Um, we have uh, PowerShell. So we have a, a really cool PowerShell um, uh, API that has some great examples here. So here's a, a PowerShell script example to do something with a SQL cluster. You know, again, we're going to take a SQL uh, cluster member out of the cluster, patch it, reboot it, and then readmit it to the to the cluster. So, uh, so we've got some great API examples on how to use it from a PowerShell perspective. Um, but then we also have a REST API. So let's say you use something, uh, you know, some kind of orchestration platform, if it's Puppet or Chef or something like that, and you really need to, to, to automate this to the nth degree, um, using that REST API makes it so that you can programmatically do just about every function, scan, patch, group, you know, you name it, um, we, can, uh, we can do that from the, the, the REST API perspective. So basic uh, with just, you know, things like uh, running scripts or batch files or PowerShell, PowerShell API and then REST API uh, at, the, at the very top. Um, okay, so I've, I've added this as a custom action. I'm gonna do that after I reboot. Uh, maybe I need to do something special with the distribution server. Um, you know, for example, uh, I have multiple different locations. You know, if I'm in the 10.1.5 office, I wanna be grabbing the, you know, the files from the Denver server instead of grabbing them, them, grabbing them from the, uh, uh, you know, the server at that particular data center. So we can save on some bandwidth, um, things like that. Um, if this is part of a, a hypervisor, you know, I picked up this virtual machine from uh, a scan of VMware, for example, um, I can actually do things like take snapshots, you know, take a snapshot before we apply any patches um, in case there was a problem or an issue as part of it, um, it, you could potentially revert that snapshot. And this can, you know, if you want to have it maintain the number of snapshots and have it purge snapshots um, when we're complete, uh, you have the ability to do that. So you can see we have multiple different deployment templates. You know, that was just a demo one that I created, but you could have ones around, you know, your exchange servers or your different sets of machines on which phases are going to reboot or what your maintenance windows are going to look like. So lots of different options uh, that we can bring to the table to, uh, to set this up. And, and we have lots of uh, great examples of customers that are using this in, in very, even very large scale, you know, patching thousands or even tens of thousands of devices, you know, worldwide with, you know, incredibly complex uh, schedules. Uh, the Avanti security uh, controls absolutely gives us the ability to, to, to do that. Um, when I'd be ready to apply these patches, you know, you can see down here which ones are going to be um, uh, applied, when I'm going to schedule it, when I'm going to stage it, and so forth. And then it would just hit this deploy button right here, and it would, it would push those patches out to the machine. Um, if I need to do a little bit more investigation on kind of what's going on with the patches, I can open it up and look at my patch context view. Um, so this gives me the ability to see what patches are out there. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we have things like a uh, grouping based on different types of patches. You know, you can see we have security patches, we have software uh, distribution, we have non-security patches. Um, the the categorization of patching is is a bit of a mess, um, and this is something that uh, is just due to the lack of standardization in in our industry. Everyone kind of makes it up however they feel like it. So, um, some of the biggest vendors, you know, like a Microsoft. Uh, they've they've created these categorizations or uh, you know criticality of saying it's critical, it's important, it's moderate, it's low. Um, so they use those kinds of distinctions, but not every vendor does. They're not mandated to use those, um, and so you'll sometimes find that that's a little bit of a struggle on whether the vendor categorizes it as such. So I want to give you the ability to see everything. You know we're going to be able to show you all patches, and then you can determine which ones you want to actually take uh, on as, as a patching process. A lot of organizations say, hey, we're already underwater. Let's just do um, uh, the, the security-based patches. Other ones say, no, we have to do uh, non-security patches. You know, uh, your choice on that. Another thing we're going to do is talk about third-party patches. Um, this is a huge blind spot in a lot of organizations. If, you know, you're a big Microsoft shop and uh, you use a product like, you know, SCCM or WSUS, um, that product's going to patch Microsoft products, and it's going to come back and it's going to tell you, you know, hey, you are your machines are patched, um, and it's it's a half truth. Uh, if you have third-party applications, which of course you do, of course you have Chrome and Firefox and Java and Flash and all these other things out there, um, you know, you still need to patch those. So if you look over here in the vendors section, you can see that we have uh, something like 80 uh, third-party vendors that we're going to provide patching content for, and most of the popular ones that everyone 
is using out there is going to show up in here. So um, Java, Flash, Firefox, Chrome, um, you know, Zoom and GoToMeeting and WebEx. And if it's a popular business application that's used out there, um, there's a very good chance that we're going to have patching content for it. And it only grows over time. You know, only more vendors are getting added to this list every single day. And so you're going to see this uh, grow as more popular applications come out and need to be patched. So we're going to give you that same kind of insight into the third party applications that you get from, uh, you know, just a, a typical like a Microsoft only. And so you still get to decide that if you, you know, only want to do uh, Microsoft patching, you know, that's perfectly fine. You can come down here and, you know, uncheck them all and say, oh, we are just going to do Microsoft and we're only going to look at, you know, Defender patching or whatever, you know, it's within your control. You can create various groups and uh, patching methodologies around what kind of content you want to scan for, what kind of content you want to patch. Um, I'm a big proponent proponent of scan for everything because more information is, is not going to hurt you. Um, and then decide what you want to patch. If you're only going to patch Microsoft, you're only going to patch a subset, that's fine. At least scan for everything so you have that kind of uh, uh, knowledge. Um, okay, so that's that's the patch window that you can um, kind of analyze what patches you're going you're gonna to look at. Um, we have a couple of other cool uh, connections into things like the actual hypervisors themselves. So, uh, you know, again, Shavik was owned for VMware for many years. And so we can actually uh, go point at your vCenter instance, for example, and scan your, your underlying ESX hosts underneath that and find virtual machines that need patching and, and find just like you saw those templates that I have that need patching. Um, and then also uh, give you the ability to uh, patch them if you want to. So you can actually scan for and patch individual hypervisor hosts. So you want to scan an ESX host, uh, see what machines are, or see what vulnerabilities are outstanding, and then patch it. You, you have the ability to do that. Um, a lot of this technology is actually wrapped up into VMware's own uh, update manager um, engine is, the, is, is our engine on the back end doing that. Um, lastly, we have a, uh, a cool option for being able to patch machines that are outside of our environment, um, and that's our Protect Cloud Sync. Um, it's as simple as um, going to a website and registering an account um, when you own the ISEC product. Um, and you can see I have this, this console here right here called ISEC, and it's registered. Um, now I have an agent. If I want to patch machines that are outside um, uh, my environment, um, I do need to put an agent on it. I, I can do it agentlessly inside the environment when they pick up and they go somewhere else. Um, I, uh, I need to have an agent on there. Um, and uh, it just calls home to the, to the Protect Cloud Sync um, and then uh, is told what uh, patches need to be applied. You know, hey, you're, you're in a certain group or you, you've been commanded to install a certain set of patches. Um, so all these devices that we're sending home, um, we can keep tabs on them and we can patch them um, uh, very easily, uh, even when they're on the outside world. Um, okay, so that was a, a very quick uh, overview of uh, the Avanti Security Controls product. Um, we have a couple questions here. Um, uh, you know, people talking about using other Avanti products, like for example, the Endpoint Manager. Um, so Avanti Endpoint Manager is a separate tool. It's completely independent from this tool from a licensing and from a functionality perspective. However, if you really dug under the covers, they use the same engine in the same database. So over in Endpoint Manager, we use the Timber database. That's the, the Timber engine and Timber database. That's what we're using here in, in security controls. So um, think of it like they have the same guts underneath, but it's a separate, um, it's a separate GUI and a different way to, to represent that, uh, that information. Um, from a licensing perspective, they are independent products. They are separate from each other. Um, however, I advocate most customers that maybe you started with Endpoint Manager and you're patching your servers with Endpoint Manager. Uh, it's not a huge cost difference to just switch over and change those licenses to uh, have them be security controls licenses. Um, it gives you a little bit more functionality. It gets you, um, uh, you know, a little more fine-grained control over your servers. The additional work of saying, well, yeah, now I have to have a separate server and a separate console to log in. I think after you, um, you use it for a while, uh, you'll see that those uh, the benefits far outweigh the drawbacks of having to manage that uh, separately. So. Uh, so it is a, a, an independent, for lack of a better term, uh, product from our uh, endpoint manager. Um, oh, someone commented on my show me the documentation sign. Uh, thank you very much. My, my wife made that for me. Um, anytime I have one of the uh, engineers on my team come in and, and tell me that they finished a project or that they completed something, I make sure to, to point to that sign. And, and they, they absolutely hate it and have learned to start working on the documentation ahead of time and uh, bring it to me completed. So. 
shameless plug if you want to sign like that, I could, my wife's Etsy store would, would make one for you. Uh, another question, can Avanti Security Controls function as a vulnerability scanner? So um, the, the answer is no, but we have some great plugins into vulnerability scanners. So a vulnerability scanner, um, I would categorize as something that's going to sweep the network and look for all vulnerabilities on the network. Printers, when someone has a default printer or, or the firmware is out of date, or uh, you know, the firewall has an open SSH port to a server. You know, those things are what I would you know, categorize as a vulnerability scanner doing. We're gonna focus on the remediation after the fact. Now, the, the problem with that is your security team, oftentimes the, the people that run the security team um, are different than the people that patch. That was always kind of a weird thing to me, but the security people always felt, oh, patching, that's, you know, that, that's beneath us. That's not our problem. We just find problems. We don't actually fix anything. Sorry if there's any security people on the phone here. Um, but they use a tool that is a vulnerability scanning engine, and they speak in the, the language of CVEs. So the language of CVEs is um, what is the exact vulnerability. If we actually open it up and look at our patches here, we know CVEs. CVEs aren't, uh, you know, that uh, that different from, uh, or, or they're not completely different language to us. Um, it, we're going to show that CVE information right here under this column. But here's the fundamental problem. They speak CVEs. We sometimes speak CVEs. Here's a perfect example. This patch right here. What is the CVE for this particular patch? It's a security patch, you know, but it, it, it is not showing up in, in their repository of CVEs. Not every patch has a CVE ID associated with it. And as you can see right here, some patches have multiple CVEs, a whole bucket of them down here, four or seven different CVEs that we have. So we need a way to um, translate CVE logic over to patching logic because they're going to run their scanner. They're going to have Nessus or Rapid7 or something like that. They're going to spit us out a 400-page report, say, good luck. I mean, what are we going to do? How are we going to sift through that and ingest that information and, and do something with it? It's a real pain in the neck. So I'll show you how we can help fix that. For that, we do that. We can talk about the CVSS score. Um, if you don't want to read um, uh, CVEs and, and try and interpret exactly what's going on, uh, this is a numerical score uh, between 0 and 10, 10 being the highest of how important it is. You know, a 9.3, that's a big deal. It's probably remotely exploitable. It's probably out in the wild. You got to jump on this. But a 2.1, you know what, you have to be very, very specific conditions in order to, uh, to meet that. So uh, if you're trying to uh, prioritize how this works, the, the higher number CVSS score uh, you should look at first. Okay, so I've gotten a report. The, the people, they ran Nessus, they gave me a 400 page report, now what? Well, what we need to do is we need to go over here and we're gonna import those CVEs. And this works with essentially every, um, uh, every vulnerability scanning tool out there. In my example, I have Nessus, but you, know, you can insert whatever yours is. We're gonna ask for that to be exported in, in CSV format, not in like PDF format or anything like that. Now this is a very long file, so, you know, 700,000 lines or something like that. So it's gonna take a little bit to process. But here's what we need to do with CVEs and how we need to interact with the security team. We need to tell them what we're going to take ownership on. And we need to tell them what we're gonna reject ownership on. Now, what are we gonna reject? Um, we need to reject when the printer has the default SNMP community. That's not a patching problem. That's not a piece of software to fix that. But somebody didn't configure the printer right. That's not my problem. When someone uh, has SSH uh, enabled on their server, that's not my problem. That's not a patching function. That is, that is a configuration issue. So we're going to take ownership of the ones that are our problem. They found an old version of Chrome. They found an old version of Java. You got it. That's on us. I take those. I'm going to take ownership of them. I'm going to fix them with my tool. And then I'm going to reject the rest and say it is not my problem to fix default SNMP communities on printers. So here's kind of what it looks like. After I've imported that CSV up here, here's all the matching Windows patches. So then I can go create a group associated with that. Maybe I want to have it in my improved environment, or maybe I'm going to put it in my staging environment, you know, whatever, whatever kind of patch cadence that you want to, to do. I'm going to accept those patches and tell the security team, I've got these. I'm taking ownership. And then over here on the side, these are the ones we're going to reject. I don't like these. These are garbage. They're nothing to do with patching. They're to do with their configuration mistakes that someone needs to else needs to take care of. So we can help integrate with that um, vulnerability scanner that comes from a third party 
and help be the remediation engine on that. So sorry, a little bit of a long-winded uh, answer, but it's a, it's a great question um, that helps us separate on, you know, are we truly a vulnerability scanning engine? I would say technically no, because we're not doing network sweeps looking for things like printers. We're doing all of that on the workstations and the servers. You know, we're doing the, the same function of, of vulnerability scanning. Um, but the more important part is, you know, actually doing that, uh, that remediation. So um, that's our uh, Avanti uh, Security Controls product. Um, so next I want to jump over to um, our Avanti Endpoint Manager product. And um, what you're going to see in this particular product, again, is a lot more of a, uh, a, a bend towards workstations. Um, it's not that I can't patch servers with this tool. I just, you know, I patch workstations a little bit better and I'll, I'll show you how and, and, and the different logic behind that. Um, same third parties. You know, we talked about those uh, Chromes and Firefox and Javas of the world. Still need to patch them. We still need to care about them. So we're going to have that same uh, database of, of patches outstanding there. Um, when I look at a vulnerability here, I can open it up and I can kind of look at the individual details associated with it. Um, let me see if I can find a slightly more interesting one. Let's go up here to our detected. Um, uh, the, we have the vulnerabilities and then we have the underlying patches and, and they are, there's a distinction between the two because this is the vulnerability, ms 18 08 s 7 4343899 underscore INTL. That is the vulnerability. However, the patch might be something different. For example, here is a patch for um, Windows 7 um, 64 bit. Here's a patch for Windows 7 32 bit. Um, if we get into some of these, you're going to see actually a large list of uh, outstanding uh, patches. Here's another good example. This is .NET 4.5 um, 64-bit, .NET 4.5 32-bit, .NET uh, 4.6 64-bit, .NET 4.6 32-bit. All of those are unique individual uh, pieces of software that need to be patched because they have this particular vulnerability in it. So we're going to take care of uh, grabbing the individual patches. You can see down here at the bottom, it says whether the, the, the state is downloaded or not. So we're going to download those um, from the internet. 99% uh, of the patches we're going to automatically spoon feed and deliver to you. Um, we've got a couple of, of obnoxious vendors out there that are, from licensing perspective, pushing back on that automatic distribution. So for example, like Oracle lately, you have to go and grab the Java file yourself and put it in place and then we can push it out, things like that. So um, you just have to go and agree to that license to, to get that file. Um, so we're going to download the, the rest of them and we're going to have them ready to go. You can see, you know, this one, it actually found it in my environment. It found Windows 7 32 bits, so it did download it. You can always right click on it and say download and override the system you want to. It'll go grab it and store it on the server. Um, the description, this is the description of what uh, is going on with this particular vulnerability. Again, CVE information. I can even click this link right here. Go to the manufacturer's website. If I'm having trouble sleeping at night, I can read this article on the exact details on how this vulnerability exists and how it's patched and uh, you know things like that. Um, I can uh, look at things like my replacement. Now we're gonna have to try and find one that is replaced to see if we can see some replacement logic. None of these have been replaced. There we go. Okay, so in the lineage of patching, um, a patch can replace something else. So in this case, uh, MSN uh, S18-07-4339284 underscore INTL, it's a mouthful. It replaces MSN 18-05-4130978 underscore INTL. So what that means is I no longer need to replace, need to repair this old patch. Now we're going to give you the ability to um, uh, retain that if you want to. Um, you know, we're not going to force you to go to the, to the most recent. We're going to give you the option. We have some logic in here to, to uh, rule out these replacements if you choose, but the logic is there to say you can go to an older one, you can go to a newer one, you can have it automatically purge the old ones and only go to the new ones, your choice. Um, however, look, this patch has already subsequently been replaced. So uh, MSN S18-11, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It replaces the patch we're looking at. So I probably wouldn't even want to apply this one. Um, so keeping those dependencies in, in track is important, making sure that we just don't dumbly push out the patches and we say, hey, maybe there's a reason we should uh, have, you know, should go to the latest. Um, uh, lots of other things like our history and our status and trending information, a lot more exciting in a, in a real environment. You'd see what that looks like. 
Um, but when we're, we're actually going to approve this set of patches, we have a really cool mechanism called autofix. So autofix is our ability to say, I want to approve this patch or these series of patches. Maybe I want to go highlight, you know, 10 of these and uh, I want to uh, approve these patches to go out in my environment. Um, I highly recommend that you have a patch pilot group. So a patch pilot group is just a series of machines that are in your environment that you're gonna test your patches out on. Now, first and foremost, do not have the five people on IT and that's it, and consider that a patch pilot group. No, 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 that's not good enough. I wanna have two people in accounting, one person in the sales department, one person over in distribution. I want a nice healthy smattering of people around the organization because they just do it differently. Users are, you know, they're unique. We know how they work. We want them to be able to find any problems on systems that maybe we wouldn't normally be running on. So get a nice, healthy mix of people in your environment. Lots of different arguments on whether um, uh, whether you should have you know one percent, five percent, ten percent. You know, I don't feel like there's a fabulous industry standard in terms of what that cadence looks like and and what that um, uh, percentages are. Um, I've been doing patching for uh, several years now, many many years. And I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of customers before talking about patching. And I deal with other products as well and things that are not patching related, but patching is just absolutely fascinating. Um, it's gonna be tough to believe this, but you're just gonna have to trust me on this one. I've never gone into two, com two companies before and had them say they patch in the same way. Every single company I have ever dealt with patches differently. Maybe they patch faster or slower, or they have a different test group or cycle or phases or circles or staging or, or groups or, you know, you name it. I've heard it all, but every single time I talk to a new customer, I hear it again, something new. Oh, I've never even heard of that before. So everyone does it so differently. We want to make sure that we have a great tool that can adapt to the way that you want to patch. And it shouldn't be a problem adapting our tools to that. But, uh, you, you know, if we need to come back and say, well, what is the right percentage of uh, people that should be in the patch pilot group, you know, I don't know, you tell me. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 5%. Um, I've, I, you know, I've heard of all. Um, so create that patch group. Um, and uh, first and foremost, do not tell them they are in the patch group. Um, if you tell them you are in the, they are in the patch group, the next time their car doesn't start, they're going to call you up and say their car doesn't start because you applied a patch to their computer. You know, we've all heard it before. They will come up with any reason um, so don't tell them they're in the patch group or in the pilot group, you know, have that be eh, kind of a secret. And if we're starting to have problems in those groups and we're getting a lot of calls into help desk, well, then we can know that. But, you know, we don't uh, we don't tell them that they've been a, a guinea pig. Um, so, you know, I have my patch pilot group. Maybe I want to roll it out to all the, the locations in my Salt Lake City office or I want to do all my workstations. You know, you name it. You just go in and check these boxes to say when you approve these patches to, to go out. Um, and this is a very patch centric view, as opposed to when we're looking at security controls, it's a little bit more server centric, a little bit more device centric, because you need to worry about those servers. They are unique. They're special. Uh, our workstations are not unique and special. They're cookie cutter. We need to just make sure that they get out there. And so um, you're going to apply the approve these patches on whatever kind of cadence or interval you want. And you're going to kind of say, I don't care when and how. We still do care when and how, and we need to be cognizant of when and how, but not at an every single day basis. So you're gonna come in here and create multiple distribution and patch settings. Um, and uh, you're gonna go in here and say, okay, I'm gonna schedule my patches to go out on a, cer on a, a certain basis. Maybe I wanna do it every, every seven days, or I wanna do it um, at only in the, in the morning from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m., or I only wanna do it on Tuesdays, or I only wanna do it on the, the fourth day of the month. I don't care. You can you can control exactly when that schedule kicks off, and there's filters for other states. Like maybe we only want to do it when their uh, machine is locked, or they have their screensaver active, or something like that. Um, you can control when this engine wakes up and does something with the end user. Because in reality, scanning is easy, and to tell you the truth, repairing is easy. I can scan, I can repair all day long. If you do it a hundred times a day. And I can probably make it pretty um, uh, invisible to your user because I got some cool things like um, we have the throttle here where I can say, you know, don't use so much CPU and things like that. So scanning, repairing, anytime, day or night, super, super easy. What about rebooting? Rebooting is the most difficult thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. The users will go out of their way 
not to reboot. It is incredibly difficult to interact with them from a reboot perspective. So we break rebooting out into its own special setting. Um, and we want to have a, a very large conversation about rebooting because this is important. Um, you know, again, back to that story about the, um, you know, telling them in the patch pilot group, if you do this wrong, you're going to make a lot of enemies around, um, around patching. It's going to get even harder to patch. So um, I have multiple settings here. You can see I have executives and laptops and store machines and, you know, whatever. You're going to go create a bunch of different settings for your environment. Um, first of all, should we prompt the user? Absolutely. Um, and look what I did. Virtual is just my fake company I used to demonstrate this. Um, I put the logo at the top. I'm going to customize this text. Uh, you know, the user gets lots, of, they get bombarded with lots of different junk. Let's at least brand this and customize it so they know it's coming from us and this is an official and sanctioned and, and things like that. So, um, you know, let's brand it with your logos at the top. Um, let's do an automatic reboot when only the following conditions are met. Maybe they've been logged out. You know, the, the computer's sitting there at the control delete screen for the last 30 minutes. Nobody's there. Let's do a reboot. Or maybe they've locked their computer. You know, they've locked it for four days and haven't come back. Or the reboot deadline has ex uh, uh, exceeded. So it's at 14 days um, and uh, they still haven't rebooted. But then we can also lay on top of that a maintenance window. So you can see there's an and in here. Have one of these conditions up here met, um, but then the, the following condition as well. Maybe we want to tell our users we're only going to do it the third Sunday of the month between midnight and 3 a.m. So um, now we can come to that middle ground. We're never, ever, ever going to uh, uh, keep users happy. So I'm not shooting for happy users um, because I'm, I'm a realist. I know it's never going to happen. Back to the fact that we're not going to get a medal for doing this patching. We are also never going to get a user that comes up to us and writes us a thank you card for patching their computer. It just doesn't work that way. Um, my goal in life is to have them not hate me. That, that is what I'm landing at, that they are, they are just not upset with me. That is a win in my book. So let's balance what they want. They never, ever, ever, ever want to reboot. And what do we want? We want to reboot every single time we apply a patch. It's got to land in the middle somewhere and make it so it's as least obnoxious to them as possible. Um, and hopefully with these settings, we can, we can coordinate that to, to happen, but we've got some cool other options like our do not disturb. Let's make it so that um, we're, we're looking at things. We have some contextual awareness of what's happening on that machine. Um, in this case, maybe I'm in a PowerPoint, you know, someone is giving a, a PowerPoint presentation. It's in full screen mode. If that's happening, don't go and ask for a reboot. It's a terrible time to pop up and do that. So, uh, you know, maybe you have some application. You have the payroll application, payroll.exe. If it's running on their machine, hey, I want to get paid. Um, don't let's not interrupt those people during that time. So this gives us the ability to uh, control when those reboots happening are happening, make it so that we interact with the user a little bit more intelligently and we keep them not happy, but we keep them not mad at us uh, either. So those are our reboot settings. Um, with our uh, automation engine, you can see that I, I went and just created some very basic, you know, approvals and some scheduling, maybe you want it even more automatic than that. So uh, we have something called uh, rollout projects. Rollout projects are a great way to have a stepped uh, approach to automation. So um, here's just my phony example. Yours, again, yours is going to be a little bit different than this, but I have three phases in my patching cycle. I have the patch pilot group. I patch all my desktops and I enable auto fix. So I go up to the top here and I say, let's look at the patch pilot group. What am I going to do with my patch pilot group? Well, I, you know, I'm going to turn on auto fix. You can see I have it set to the patch pilot group. Um, I'm going to have a certain exit criteria. I want to wait three days. So patches are going to come in, go out to the patch pilot group, and then I start a timer. I'm going to sit there and wait for three days to, to do something else. Um, then maybe I need to have um, a success rate. I don't want to move on until I have 80% success. Uh, and in our book, if you don't need a patch, it's still technically a success. We don't consider that a failure. Um, but I want to have 80% success before I move on to the next step. Uh, after three days. And maybe I want to have an approval. So I can check this box. It's going to send an email off to me and say, hey, I'm finished with this step. Am I okay to move, we'll move on to the next step? Sure, let's do it. Maybe the next step is patching all the desktops. And so uh, same kind of thing. I go in here and change my uh, auto fix settings associated with that. Same kind of thing over duration. I want to wait seven days this time. Maybe my cadence is you know, three days and seven days or whatever. Um, and uh, before I go to the next step, I want another you know, success rate of a certain amount, or maybe I don't care in this particular step. Um, and then lastly, enable auto fix. So rollout projects gives us the ability to say, you know, hey, we, we, we've all decided what this is. We know how patches come in. We know where they're going to go. Um, why do we, 
you know, why do we have to go and do a lot of extra clicking? So this makes it so that the, the engine will do most of the work. Maybe it's just, you know, emailing me and asking for uh, a, uh, an approval to move on to the next step if necessary. So um, that's one way to kind of do automation with our rollout projects. Um, you saw we could do it over with the REST API over on the uh, uh, security control side as well. Uh, additionally, we have uh, something called download settings. A lot of people say, you know what, don't even bother asking me about Microsoft's critical. If it's Microsoft and it's critical, I am just going to patch it no matter what. I don't even look at them. Okay, that's fine. I'll go in here and say if the vulnerability is, is critical and the vendor contains Microsoft, maybe I want to automatically send that out to my uh, patch pilot group. I don't want to ask anyone. So I could go in here and um, uh, you know approve that for a certain subset. So you can create some rules around criticalities, around vendors, um, and help uh, triage these patches as they're coming in and, and having them and uh, to decide um, where they're going to land. Um, all right, so uh, patching machines outside our environment is uh, very important as well. And here in the endpoint manager, we have something called the cloud services clients. Uh, the CSA, the only difference between this and that other technology is this is actually kind of an on-prem version. You're going to actually install this in DMZ. It's a hardened Linux appliance. We're going to give it a public name and a public IP address. And then when it, a device that's outside on the outside world needs to apply a patch, um, it's going to try and find the server. If it can't find the server because VPN is off or it's not in the office, it's going to communicate over the internet. It's going to talk to the CSA and then it's going to bring that information down. So um, gives us the ability to manage those machines even when they're outside uh, uh, our environment. Uh, this is just more than patching, just like Endpoint Manager does more. So remote control, pushing out software. Heck, we can do Windows 7 to Windows 10 upgrades over the CSA. So um, this is more than just a patching engine for Endpoint Manager. We, we use it for a lot of the other functions as well. Um, as we scroll through here, uh, a lot of these patches, uh, we probably need to go up here to our, our scan, look at all of our patches. Um, Windows 10 builds are going to be in this list, um, you know, in 1809, 1909, 2004. Uh, those things are really not treated much different than um, a, another patch. They're just a big fat service pack is really all they are. So um, we have to wait for it to pull up here, but you'd be able to find those um, uh, Windows builds in here and then push them out with the same kind of uh, control of what group gets them, what series of machines, uh, you know, who's allowed to push that out. Um, all that same logic would apply to uh, a Windows 10 build, um, just like it would a, you know, a typical patch that comes out on, on any day out there. Um, so we have to scroll through and find it, but the Windows 10 builds um, are there as well. Um, uh, from a management perspective as well, we can do uh, Mac machines. Endpoint Manager has the ability to do uh, uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. So uh, all those same functions, all the same reboot options, all the same patching third-party applications um, applies to uh, Mac as well. So Endpoint Manager can, um, you know, truly be that unified Endpoint Manager for, for all your different uh, types of devices. Um, lastly, I want to show you a little bit about um, reporting. Um, Extraction is our enterprise dashboarding and reporting tool. The great part about Extraction is if you already own one of these products, you get this for free. There's not an additional cost associated with it. Um, and this helps solve the problem that you, you've all inevitably had. Um, you know, if I'm back over here in the tool and I want to pull some information, I got really cool things like queries. I can run a query. I can export this information. Bam. I now have a CSV with, um, uh, with the, the information that I wanted to. But people that don't use the tool, um, they're sometimes frustrated by that. Uh, what am I going to do? The CSV is, you know, 57 pages long. And now what? Um, extraction gives us the ability to make things pretty. I know that's a funny thing to say, but let's all be honest. Appearances matter, and what an executive or what a, what someone in management what they see if they if we can add some color, if we can add some charts, if we can add some graphs, they're going to love it. So here's a bunch of out-of-the-box um, reports that we have for all of our different products, you know, for security controls, for endpoint manager, things like that. Um, uh, and uh, I love to do this where you could, you know, hang a TV on the wall, drag this over here, and have it sit there and cycle through these various reports. Um, this is all about appearances. I'd love someone to walk by and say, oh, wow, these guys are paying attention to patching. Um, you know, it's, it's on their list. Look at, look at all these reports and graphs and charts that they have going. It's, it's, it's important to them. Um, so you can take these dashboards, you can also, you know, export them out. Uh, wouldn't it be great for someone that's bugging me for a patch report? Tell you what, I'm going to send you a PowerPoint of this, excuse me, every single uh, uh, first of the month, 
and I'm deliver it right to your mailbox. So you don't have to call and ask me for uh, the, these reports when we deliver them right to you. Um, maybe I want to create my own report. I go down here to the dashboard designer and uh, I could create a group and I'm going to create a pie chart based on, you know, who knows, uh, the operating system. So there, now I have a pie chart based on my operating systems. And the next I want to have uh, a bar chart based on some kind of patch status. You know, you name it, you would just come in here and create the different uh, uh, dashboards that you want, save them, and then you can have them uh, used just like those other reports that we saw. So that's extraction, comes for free uh, to report against your endpoint manager or report against your uh, security controls product. If you don't have it, um, you know, please get it installed. It's not very hard. It's only an hour or two and you can have the whole thing um, up and going. Okay, so that was a quick uh, overview of our endpoint manager product and, and extraction. Um, I got a bunch of questions here that I got behind on, so I'm gonna stop for a second and, and try and catch them. Um, uh, question, any guidance on how many distribution servers need to cover around 2,000 systems? Would one be sufficient? So that's a complex question. Um, the, the problem is, is that uh, in security controls, when we're talking about our distribution servers, um, usually the server itself is slightly less important as is the bandwidth. And so, for example, if, if I have 2,000 servers and they're all parked in the same data center and I got 10 gig connectivity to all of them, yes, one is probably perfectly fine and, and is going to be able to handle that. But if I have 2,000 servers and one in the UK and one in the US and one in APAC and one in Australia, you know, if, if I'm spreading them out and, and there's a WAN in between them, the WAN will drive more about the distribution server um, uh, number than the uh, just the server itself because that's just you know serving up the files um, and so it's 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 not a cut and dry answer there um, if you want to we can have a follow up afterwards and kind of help you architect that uh, the the quantity of distribution servers that you would potentially need and then also you got to layer on top of it like how many are we patching at the same time are we patching two thousand servers at the exact same moment well that's a lot of I/O we might need to uh, spin that up or have it on SSDs or caching, things like that. But, oh no, we spread it out over a huge maintenance window. Maybe it's not going to be that big of a deal. So i um, sorry I don't have perfect guidance on that, but if you want to have a, a conversation after the fact, I'd be happy to do that. Um, another question, I found Microsoft security patches that security controls was not able to download. And when I attempted uh, to manually download, Microsoft says they are no longer available. Um, it's potential that they pulled those patches. Uh, Microsoft doesn't do it very often, but they do pull security patches. Um, we had a pretty bad one this last February, I believe. And so um, there's a good chance that we created the definition um, and uh, had the patch at one point and then Microsoft pulls the patch and they don't want us distributing anymore. So um, I'll check in to see if there's a way that, that there's like a flag or notation in that uh, particular patch that would, that would help us uh, indicate that. Another question, uh, how does security controls determine if a patch is actually needed? So, the the engine behind the scenes that timber engine is a uh, it, it's not a product that Microsoft creates um, so it's not you know the baseline security analyzer or any any of that junk uh, it's Avanti's own logic behind it because it's not just Microsoft it's those third party applications as well um, and so. Uh, we're going to have our own unique detection logic for being able to detect that. Um, let me see if it actually shows this logic um, here. So in this particular case, this particular vulnerability is going to look for, um, and again, not every patch is exactly the same. So you got to take each one of these and evaluate them individually. It's going to look at this particular registry key and then down here in the bottom, it's going to look at these individual files. So this system 32 directory is going to look for RPC HTTP.dll and it's going to look for this very, very particular version of it. So what that means is we don't trust the vendors. I'm sorry, we don't. If they say, hey, I installed this patch, we say, okay, I'm going to go check. I'm going to look at the actual um, you know, version itself. I'm going to trust, verify, and make sure that that file has been updated or that registry key now has changed, something like that. So most of the time we're actually going and looking at the individual files to see if those versions have been increased. And if not, we're saying, hey, this patch didn't apply. I don't care if it said it applied, the version of that particular DLL is still not up to date. It's not, um, you know, it's not fixed. Uh, another question here, um, are there any online training sessions uh, for Avanti? 
that we can review for internal admin training. Absolutely. So uh, there's something relatively new called the um, uh, Vonti Academy. Vonti Academy. And I think they're actually changing the name on this. So it's called the Global Academy. Um, so what the Global Academy is, is it's a, um, it's a, a subscription training system that's great because it has recorded videos. It has um, instructor online led uh, training, and then also has when the world stops ending actually uh, on site where you can go to a classroom and, and have a training session. So um, you sign up for it, it's just a subscription cost, and then consume those ad hoc recorded versions, um, but then also maybe just attend one where it's a you know real live instructor, instructor on the internet uh, teaching the class. So uh, go have a look at that. Uh, the Avanti Global Academy is a good fit for, uh, for those kind of trainings. Um, as well, if you, you haven't already, I know it sounds incredibly simple and it might match my sign right back there, but I found that they've done a really good job lately of, of collapsing all of the true help content into one location. And I don't know if you saw me type in that URL, it's help.avanti.com. Um, all of the product documentation lives right here. I can go in right down here to security controls, click on the uh, installation guide and you know it's right to that information. It's got a pretty good search up here. So I've found that this is the best place. This is where I start. We still have the community. So the Avanti community has a combination of it. You know, it's a knowledge base and, and question and answer and things like that. And that's good, but the, 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 the raw documentation itself is sometimes the best place to start. I've found this to be very helpful. And now it's all in right the same exact spot. Um, so help.avanti.com is, is a great shortcut to, to, to find that uh, documentation. Uh, another question, is there a good way to kick off a roll-off projects with complex dates such as start the Friday after patch Tuesday, um, aka the Friday after uh, the second Tuesday of the month? Um, I, I am not aware of that logic. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, the guys that I have uh, that are on my deployment team, um, they very likely have the answer to that. I'm uh, For those that don't know who I am or where I came from, I was a deployment engineer for this product for 10 years. but uh, for the past, past five or so, I've been in, in pre-sales, and so uh, sometimes get a little bit rusty at, at those harder questions. So uh, I'm going to do some research and, and try and follow up with you on uh, the, the scheduling of that logic in a much more complex fashion. You know, again, if we brought into the equation uh, APIs and things like that, you could always do more complex things and, and query outside sources, but, uh, but let, me, let me go find that out. Um, next, I found that uh, you have to build uh, the major Windows builds using the Windows ISO and that they don't download. Absolutely true. Um, so if, if I have a, um, a, a Windows build in here, um, we do not provide the content for that. So somewhere in here is the 1809, here's Windows 10 version 1809 Enterprise. Um, absolutely, we do not provide the download for that. It is the, you need the ISO, and you need to use that, um, there's that Windows 10 media creation tool. You can just download it. It only takes about you know, 30 minutes to do it. We cannot give that out. Microsoft doesn't allow us to deliver those ISOs to you directly. So go grab the media creation tool, download it, go plop it into the folder. You can see that we know, know we cannot download it and know it's not downloaded. Look at that, right click open patch folder. That's a shortcut that'll tell you exactly where it's at. Here's all the patches in here. Just go pop that ISO in there. Make sure it's named exactly what it expects it to name right there, and then it's going to detect that. So use the use the media creation tool, uh, make the ISO, rename it, plop it in that directory, and then you'll be good to go uh, as it relates to, to Windows 10 builds. Good question. Um, do you run into any issues of patching a system with various software, then not rebooting for some period of time? Absolutely. Um, now. I, I don't know this for a fact with every piece of software, but I have heard uh, customers talk about this before. So we've kind of just started to say, yeah, that is the best practice. Patch and then reboot as relatively quickly as possible. So um, uh, I, would, I would highly recommend that your patch windows and your maintenance windows be uh, relatively tight. You know, I don't want to see it lingering out there for seven days or 10 days or 14 days. Um, you know, that's also going to be a problem if uh, you're trying to do any root cause analysis. You applied the patch um, and the log says you applied it on the first. They didn't reboot until the 21st. They started calling with complaints on the 22nd. You're gonna say, well, geez, you've had patches? There's no, no new patches in the past three weeks. It's probably not a problem. So yeah, I try and shrink that window down as, as reasonably as possible without 
um, uh, you know, without getting your tires slashed by your users. Um, uh, one more question. So those training resources should be included with our purchase. That depends. The Global Academy that I showed you, uh, this thingy right here, that's a separate subscription. So you, you probably have to pay for that. Now, uh, I know lots of different companies that just negotiate that as part of their sale, um, but it's not automatically included. Um, we, you can just check with your uh, Avanti or NCSI salesperson, find out if you're entitled to that, um, but it's not necessarily included. All the other stuff like the help documentation and the, and the forums and things like that, yeah, that's just for free online, but Global Academy is. Uh, is an extra is an extra purchase. Um, another question: Oracle's come to us and told us that there is actually against their terms of service um, uh, since we're a business. Does Avanti have any comment on that? Oof! Especially me as an engineer, I am not a lawyer. No comment. Um, that is complicated software licensing legalese stuff. So I cannot comment one way or the other. Um, uh, that unfortunately has to be between you and the, the manufacturer. If you put that file in a directory though, I can push it out from a technical perspective. That's, um, that's the best I can tell you around uh, things like the Java patches. So sorry to dodge that question, but uh, um, I'd have to quit my job, go to law school and become a, a software patent lawyer to, to figure out how to do that the right way. So um, one more question, is there a way when reboot time expires to then give the user a time to shut down uh, so as uh, just not uh, to reboot and interrupt the user. Um, so you can do that with a combination of the logic inside the reboot settings. Um, so at a minimum, their last time that it would open when that we're, you know, cause we can allow them to snooze it. Um, in this little box right here, um, we can give them the option to, uh, to, to snooze it and we could make it so that that last one would have some kind of warning that in this box they have reboot and the snooze is now grayed out and so it could still be a warning so inside the endpoint manager absolutely you know snooze 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 and the last one is not going to catch them off guard and and just magically reboot it's going to give them options there so um, so we do have the option to do that okay so um i believe i hit everyone's question here um if, uh, if I didn't catch anyone or you have any more uh, questions, you, you know, feel free to uh, email me. Um, here's my uh, contact information. You can, you can hit me up or call me. I'd be happy to have a further conversation about uh, how your patching was working or, or more about what we did today. Um, just like John mentioned, uh, we have a really cool uh, offer that's outstanding from Avanti right now for the Avanti Cloud. If you haven't heard about it, we've got some videos on our YouTube channel, more about that. Uh, really cool um, for uh, today's uh, people working from home and all of our devices all around the world. Um, and I, I really think that's going to be the future of, of how we manage our devices. So um, uh, check it out on our website or YouTube channel, and you can uh, sign up for a free version of that. Um, John says he's going to be uh, sending out those uh, goggles. Um, I haven't got my pair, so I assume he's going to be shipping me one as well. And then you better believe he'll, he'll be complaining to him if, uh, if I don't get it. Uh, we're going to record this and put it on YouTube if you need to review it later. Um, and please uh, keep tabs on our events page there uh, for upcoming uh, events uh, that we're going to have uh, over the summer. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, attending. Um, and if you have any questions, there's my email address. Please hit me up. But uh, everyone have a fabulous day and stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone.